Welcome to my basement, everybody. We are still celebrating the launch of Mass Effect Legendary Edition. Of course, you can't drop three massive games like that and us not talk about it for many, many, many weeks after it. Uh, Mac Walters is the project director on Mass Effect Legendary Edition. And uh, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Uh, it's great to see you. It's been a long time since we've been able to hung out. I think that one of the last conversations that we had, you were working on the comic world oh, around yeah. Mass Effect. Yeah, yeah. That was you, a while ago. Yes. Talking about um, going to the Wayback Machine. All well, right. How are you feeling? You've, you just launched the game. It's out there in yeah. people's hands, and you must be hearing from everybody. I'm sure your Twitter is uh, basically a QA stream of, <laughs> of notes and things at this point. Yeah, yeah. I, honestly, uh, I'll be honest, just feeling uh, very uh, relieved at this point. You know, I think there's a lot of um, anticipation around this. Fans have been asking for it for a long time. They've been very clear in what they want and, you know, navigating that path of what do you change? What do you keep the same? How do you make sure it still feels like Mass Effect, but you're actually improving it? It's it's a fair bit of pressure. So getting it out there and getting people uh, actually playing it, you know, is is honestly just a huge Huge relief in it and seeing the the reception to it so far is also just yeah the team is is overjoyed i i gotta tell you brother it is amazing to jump back into these games they were yeah. so finely crafted right from the beginning there was so yeah. much world building and attention to detail you yeah. just felt like you're in like getting into a bath you know with the world that you guys <laughs> crafted but on top of that you guys had to up convert everything and get it ready for the new machines i'm playing it on the uh, xbox series x and nice. I got a note nice. from uh, EA's PR that there's going to be a day one patch because there's there was some sync issues with the headphones, and it was it was just so funny. It was just so small in contrast right. to the, the, you know the massive bug patches and and uh, day one fixes that are happening in games these days. So kudos on that. Thank but you. Thank talk you. to me about about doing this job about actually you know, handling this workload because you're dealing with hundreds of hours of content. Yeah. Was it a scary proposition or did you guys have a pretty clear idea of how you were going to do it? I mean, I always enter these things with a sense of trepidation. That's just my nature, right? You know, tread cautiously. Um, I think one thing I would say to that, though, is just a huge shout out to our quality assurance, quality verification sure. teams. Like, uh, if you think about you know, the amount of content in these games, right? Just the, the fact that it's three games plus all the DLC. Yeah. But they've got to test all the choices, right? Like just start thinking about that. Oh, and that, and by the way, now you've got to test it on all the all the different platforms. And then we introduce something on consoles where you've got like a favorite frame rate mode and a favorite quality mode. Um, you got to test both of those. Like it just explodes the amount of time that they have to spend testing this and you you kind of touched on it at the, at the at the start there when you're talking about you know releasing this without too much um you know outstanding issues and things like that and trying to keep the patch size as small as we go forward that's really hard to do because anytime you touch this game again it's especially mass effect one uh you know over 12 years old now there's that chance that just by doing one thing over here it breaks something over there it's just the totally. nature of it there, there's a bit of brittleness to the that first one uh, we were i was talking to uh greg zeschuk the other day and he was laughing about it and just saying you know like we 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 did so much in me2 just because we we figured we hadn't done it right in me1 right it was just you know first time on those that console generation first time in unreal for us back in the day right so um yeah i mean uh, we just you know staying focused on quality and making sure that we you know like i think there was um i think ultimately we found over 20,000 bugs in the three in the three titles now obviously we created some yeah <laughs> just by the process of remastering and everything like that um, but a lot of those are actually what we would call legacy bugs as well. And we, we went through and um, some, some we uh, couldn't fix for whatever reasons, but a lot of them, like the vast majority, like I think over 18,000 bugs, we actually fixed. Um, and it, yeah, yeah, daunting is a good word for it. And, That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Well, listen, we are uh, streaming this live for those mm -hmm. of you that may be listening to this podcast in audio format. Thank you for uh, tuning in and listening. 
Uh, but we do have a live chat, and I want to assure everybody here, I see Adrian Leon and NHS Admin and Mondo Blasto. I'm going to ask a few questions. Help me out and make the questions all caps so I can see them, and they'll pop a little bit on screen. I also <laughs> want to give a special call out to our friends at the Gaming Stadium. They are Canada's leader in online tournament facilitation. They've got tournaments happening every weekend, and you don't want to miss out on the cool stuff that they've got going on. You can sign up with them at tgs.gg. And uh, so I, I want to get into a little bit of uh, like the beginning days of this. Like, was this mm. something difficult to pitch to um, the squad at Bioware, or was were there hoops that you had to jump through with EA, or was this a no brainer for everybody? Um, you know, it's funny. Yeah, I've been asked that a few times, and honestly, this was in many ways, no different than pitching any idea that we've had. Um, sure. You know, it's something that we've talked about internally at Bioware off and on again, probably for three, four years of trying to do. But you always have to find that right time where, you know, you've got the right support for it. You need someone to lead the charge, right? Um, and certainly I was available at the time when we started talking about it in this round. Uh, Casey Hudson was back in the studio and he was keen to do it. So once uh, it was one of those things where it's like, oh, the stars aligned. And then we push forward on it. And um, yeah, but like I said, you know, we had kind of you know, sort of peeled back the first the first of many layers a few times just to go, oh, what if we did this? You know, what would it take? And and so we just picked up from there and took it the next step and, and then finally just kicked it off. Like uh, I think it was September of 2019 when we finally got going. That's great. I, I, I know that Casey, he's no longer at Bioware and that must have been, it, I mean, this was during the progress of putting this game together and that must have been a, not great news, but you're, you yeah. know, a huge company and you have to roll with whatever happens. But was that something that he helped to kickstart within uh, Bioware? And uh, was it important for him that that uh, uh, Bioware kind of go back to its Mass Effect roots, so to speak? Um, yeah, I think, you know, again, I, the fans have been very vocal about this. You know, we, we were, you know, it, it's interesting because you go back and you realize, uh, not only did we do, you know, three games in a trilogy, we actually got them all out in a single console cycle. Yeah. Right. Like, it's crazy when yes. you think about it. But that yes, also, I meant, know. Yeah. I was also talking with we, Mark and Jennifer about that. It's like, not yeah. only were they massive, no pun yeah. intended, I keep doing that, uh, yeah. but they were, uh, they were consistent. Like you'd get yeah. a new one. Every, like that's, I yeah. mean, it was impossible. And when you see it again in retrospect, it's like, how the hell did they do this? Yes. It's insane. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember how we did it, to be honest. <laughs> um, but yeah, but that also meant we had never dipped a toe into that next console uh, yeah. cycle, right? So uh, it, as a developer, you're looking at that going, wow, there's a lot of opportunity there and you'd really like to to do it. So we were keen. And I, I would say, uh, just to answer your question, certainly Casey coming back, putting his weight behind it, you know, and saying, yes, this is something we should do. And I think there's value here for the fans um, and for the studio at Bioware to do this. And and uh, that's that's for sure what helped get it kickstarted. That's awesome. This is an excellent question. Uh, this is from CH3RU. Was there a remake versus remaster discussion internally? Yeah, great question. And there was. Uh, it wasn't a long discussion, but I can walk you through sort of what our thinking on that was. So um, I think first off the bat, two and three hold up really well, yep. right? So yep. you kind of look at those and go, yeah, and, and what two is like one of the highest rated games period, you know, yep. ever, yep. why would you remake that? Right. Um, one on the other hand, okay, there's an argument, maybe, maybe you, you want to do that. But then, like you said, we did these all as an original, you know, trilogy on one, one engine, one platform. How do you remake just one, um, you know, without it feeling like it's now the odd duck out plus, you know, as much as you, he, there's all those sort of rough edges and little quirky things in, in mass effect one, some of that's the magic. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. The, like whether you like it or not, it's not always just the things that we got right that make people enjoy it. It's sometimes the things that we kind of just missed a little bit on, but then yeah. it becomes endearing. Yeah. And so uh, my take on it, at least, was I don't want to spend, you know, two years uh, chasing magic and chasing your tails, trying to recreate magic. I would mm -hmm. rather we know it's there. Let's just get some of the the rough edges off, so the, the magic can really shine through. And so that that was that was our initial take. And I, like I said, it was one of the first questions we had, but we did put it on the table. We put a lot of things on the table uh, just for due diligence, and then you know slowly whittled it down to what we wanted to do. 
what was it like to go back to Unreal 3? You know, I mean, the, you guys had shifted over to Frostbite. Yeah. And there's, there's so much forward momentum in this medium. Yeah. What was it like to go back? Well, I mean, yeah, it's so funny going back into the code or into some of the design and, and some of the scripting. And you just like, you know, I've opened up conversations that I wrote back in the day and you just kind of. That's awesome. It, it is awesome. It's also mortifying as a developer because, I mean, <laughs> being confronted with, with all your mistakes of the past is fun. But, you know, ultimately, um, that was actually another uh, one of the questions we put on the table. We actually sat down with Epic and said, look, if we wanted to bring this to UE4, for example, what does that look like? Right. And it was kind of the same thing. I think mm -hmm. the example we often use is that uh, ship of Theseus. You know, if you if you sort of rebuild, if you, mm -hmm. if you replace every plank in a, a ship is it still the same ship in the end? And we were kind of feeling that way with going to UE4. It's not that it obviously wouldn't have all these stellar things that we could do with it, but would it still be Mass Effect at the end of it? Right. Um, the big one for me anyway, was just the, you know, uh, UE3 used a, a Kismet a scripting language, right? And so much of what Byers does is scripting, like the conversations, the combats, everything in there is, is sort yes. of hand tweaked by designers. Yeah. Yes. You've now got to go, redo all that there's no copy paste there's going to be variants there's going to be things again so you kind of start losing some of the magic and and for something that is is sort of touted as a remaster i it just it ultimately That's total I, remake territory if you yes, did that right? exactly right yeah. and and you know if you're going to go to ue4 why look backwards look forwards like do something amazing do something incredibly new like we did right. in the original one right so. right um what Okay, this is from Black Superman. What do we have to do to let you know how bad we want ME3 <laughs> multiplayer back? Is this the, the the tweet you get the most right now? Um, there's there's that and and also the uh, English VO in the <laughs> in in some of the uh, localized languages as well. Those would be the two, and uh, that one we're looking into. We'll see where we get to um, for the multiplayer. You know, honestly, here's the thing: like you've kind of hit on the top three things that we kind of uh, went over when we were starting this and multiplayer was the third one. It was the hardest decision. Right. Um, yeah. I think ultimately uh, what happened was like, I was a huge, like for Andromeda, I was a big proponent. I wanted multiplayer. I thought it was part of the franchise going forward. Yeah. But when you look at remaster expectations on a multiplayer title versus mm -hmm. a single player, they're actually slightly different and they don't always overlap. They don't always play nice together. Um, multiplayer, you know, titles have come a long way, obviously since 2012 right. when we released it. And we just felt like we're going to really be dividing our attention and our efforts uh, to make this uh, remaster if we if we do that. So the, it was a, it was a hard decision. Um, getting back to I guess the actual question, you know, what do they have to do to tell us? Just just keep telling us, you know. I think you know, <laughs> there, we I'll be honest, we didn't we we were very careful to not back ourselves into a corner in such a way that we couldn't you know, allow it to happen one day, yeah. uh, but there yeah. are absolutely no current plans to make it happen. So. Well, I got to be honest, Mac. I mean, I, it would be great to see you flesh that out and put mm -hmm. that in there. But I mean, the, the game is just so loaded with hours and hours of yeah. escape yeah. that I, I personally would rather you guys focus your energies on something new, you know, whether it's yeah. a, a, a side mission or a side story within the timeline so that we get more Commander Shepard adventure uh, yeah. or, you know, some kind of modern reinvention. And obviously we can't really dive too deep in, unless we want to. I mean, do you want to tell us a little <laughs> bit about something that might be percolating? We've seen some teasers on what's next for Mass Effect. Yeah, no comments on the future, but uh, I always appreciate when people try and ask. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Yeah, what, yeah. what is it about Mass Effect? You know, had you mm. worked on other titles at yep. Bioware yeah, prior I worked, on, to worked on Jade, Jade Empire. Yeah. And actually pretty much from the beginning of that. So built that world out as well. And Amazing. Yeah. But uh, what, what, what is, is it about Mass Effect? I mean, I, I was talking with Jennifer and Mark a little bit yeah. about this. It's It feels almost like Star Wars did, where, where you come yeah. into the adventure mid-stride. And it's yeah. going on, and you've entered that world. And Mass mm. Effect kind of feels like that right from the beginning of the first game. Yeah, you know, I, I've tried to answer this question, I think, a few times and just, you know, um, 
there is no one thing. I think that's yeah. that's ultimately what it comes down to. There's no one thing. There's the super deep and robust world building that you get. Like you said, it's just you feel like you could be reading codex entries or you could be just, you know, exploring uncharted worlds or what have you for days. And and there's all this. It, it just, it, you you know, it, it always delivers. There's always something there to kind of pull you along. Um, ultimately, I think one of the biggest things is really just the freedom of playing the way you want to play. Right. And and I was talking to someone about this recently. I'd done a um a full renegade, like, I mean, full renegade just playthrough. Scumbag. Yeah, just because I'd done everything else. And uh, I'd never fully done that all the way through. And uh, aside from it being very cathartic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that I found interesting was it, it meant that I played through Mass Effect 2 as kind of a lone wolf, mm. right? Um, and which I also hadn't done because a lot of times I'm testing the dialogues and I have to go in and I want to see how everyone's doing. And in this case, I was kind of like, meh whatever, I got this, you know, I know how this is going to end, but whatever. And then I realized, you know, um, I think I realized it before, but it, it hammered at home, which is, that's a choice as well. Like you don't have to engage in characters at all. You don't have to engage in a lot of the things we have. You can actually just be like, hey, I'm just going to enjoy this for the shooter aspects alone and just run and gun my way through that. But the fact that choice is supported in so many ways, but then also consequence comes from that it's like if you're going to be a lone wolf well guess what no no spoilers but you know we know what's going to happen in mass effect 2 and then in mass effect 3 right so i think that really you know you you bring that combination of it's action it's adventure it's this epic sci-fi universe and you get to tell the story the way you want to right like yeah what could, what more do you want what were you guys looking at in, in the video game industry as you were putting the first Mass Effect together? What were you taking your cues from? Because this was a massive, ev again, with the massives, I can't not. <laughs> I know. Yeah. That's <laughs> why we called it that. <laughs> yeah. This was a big evolution for yeah. the company, right? Yeah. So w what what was in your target? What what other titles and other things happening in games kind of influenced this, this big step? That's a really good question. You know, I think um, in talking with Casey a lot about back in the day, it was a lot about what movies inspired us because mm -hmm. they're like, uh, when you think about those, those uh, uh, epic sort of sci-fi sagas from the eighties and stuff like that, who was doing anything like that other than maybe a Blade Runner, um, you yeah. know, game or something like that. Yeah. And then of course we had started to push into more cinematic storytelling in KOTOR, right? And we're kind of feeling our way around there. Jay took it a, a step further, I would say. Yep. And I thought, I think it all just kind of came down to, you know, what if you could really make this feel like a movie you were playing, right? Um, and that, I remember that talking about that a lot in, in ME1 development is like, this really should feel like a cinematic experience, right? right. Um, even the invention, you know, a lot of people forget the, the it seems kind of almost commonplace now, the, the conversation wheel. Right. Like yep. we literally patented that back yep. in the day. Yeah. And that was in service of allowing you to feel like, yeah, I still have a choice, but I can make it, I can allow the scene to continue mm -hmm. and, and play out without really having to pause. And, you know, a bunch of, you know, that was the whole paraphrasing system. So you kind of quickly get through things and really move the scene along as you would in a movie or, or, or TV show or something like that. So I think a lot of it was, looking back to some of the things that got us excited, whether it was aliens or yeah, Blade Runner, Star Wars, things like that. And then saying, what would that experience be like, you know, on such a massive, I'll do it too, epic scale, uh, but in games. Right. And then of course the, you know, uh, kudos to Casey for having the, the foresight to go, let's make it a trilogy with choices that matter all the way through. And that's what we're doing. And, and that was the plan right from the very beginning with right the game. From the, yep. Yep. That's amazing. But there were huge changes at Bioware during all that. And I think the, the first yeah. Mass Effect game was uh, an Xbox exclusive. Xbox exclusive. And yeah. then, I mean, there, it looked like, I mean, when you play the three games side by side like that, you see the cash injection. You see that there's just, I guess, the success of Mass 1 sort of yep. dovetailed into how much ambition you had going forward, right? Yeah. Well, and you know, I think a lot of it too, to be perfectly honest, was just keeping like it's it's pretty rare, uh, and I'm sure you've spoken to a lot of people about this, but it's pretty mm. rare to be able to keep a team, a core team together for three full games, right? right. And in yeah. a short span, and so yeah. you know we finished each game chomping at the bit 
mm. to fix our mistakes and go on and then, okay, how do we evolve? How do we improve Mac, this? I how do we always say this, forward? man. Like if you, if you give a dev team three kicks at it, that third yeah. game is going to blow yeah. people away. I right. always say, I mean, you look at yeah. Burnout, you look at Grand Theft Auto, there's many yeah. examples of this. Totally. You, you got to let you guys kind of get to know what you're building, right? Because you're making yeah. something out of nothing. Oh, yeah, totally. Like, I mean, uh, you know, and I think even looking back at it, like some of the things that we did uh, on that cinematic side yeah. are mind boggling. Like I, I've talked, talked to a few people in TV and, and movies about it and they're like, how's it different? What's, what's unique. And I said, well, okay, you have to build your sets. So do we, but then imagine that you had to build your set so that you can allow someone to fully explore it afterwards. Right. Like, you don't just get to shoot it from two angles and you're done right now. Now the, the viewer gets to run around in that set and do what they want and kick yeah. over stuff and yeah. do things. You Not have to, to mention build this screwdriver that lets you build the set. <laughs> exactly right, yeah. and then you have to build the cameras. If you want a dolly yeah. for your camera, you you're building that right, and you're defining all that. Characters are a great one, right? Like. How easy is it? Well, I, I don't want to belittle it. It's not easy. But an actor walks onto the set. You assume they bring their talent. Right. They read the lines. Uh, they they do a, an amazing performance. And that's all encapsulated with a single actor and a director giving them that that direction, right? And the words that they were able to write. A character is made up of so many contributions, different contributions on a, on a game, right? And they all have to come together, yeah. including the the voice and performance that you get in there, plus the writing and then all the animating afterwards. And it's just like the fact that it even comes together at all always just, you know, <laughs> astounds me. Does Bioware approach the development of every game in the same way still? Because you've done yeah. these action adventure role playing, uh, you know, genre busting experiences again and again. Is it the same disciplines or? How was how have things shifted, yeah. and then how did you take that education into doing this remaster? That's a, that's a really uh, good question. You know, I think one of the you know when Bioware has been at its strongest, and mm. and and you know, I I'll, let's just look back at you know Mass Effect One when we were starting off. There is a sense of leaning into our strengths, like we're, we we've always been big into story and character but also pushing the boundaries in those areas, right? So there's that that mix of the familiar, but also let's push into the unknown a little bit, right? And and so I would say, if you call that sort of the core of what's at Bioware, yes, I do think we approach most titles the same way, which is lean into our strengths, but where can we innovate and what can we do different? And what can we do that's kind of cool? Because I mean, even as a developer, you always want to be pushing the boundaries a little bit, right? Um, and then as far as, you know, yeah, the, the remaster was, um, it was the first title really like this that we've ever done. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there, it was interesting because there was, we, there was all this, again, stuff that we knew, you know, the games are done essentially. Um, but all these kind of questions about how far could we push it? And, you know, uh, an example that I like to talk about with the, the automation was, or the sort of innovation was, uh, when we first started talking about it, um, you know, doing digital, uh, or sorry, AI sort of upraising mm -hmm. um, was, you know, people were doing it, but it was, it seemed a little bit like future science. And it's like, I don't know, like, is that something we could depend on? But we actually looked into it because our modders were doing it. And then we started experimenting with it. Like, you know what, if we can actually use this uh, to uprise at least the textures, like the base, you know, just the baseline, that lets us actually then focus on all the art and improving all of the art. Um, and uh, so it was a fun little sort of experiment that we got to like push this and, and literally tens of thousands of textures from all three games and titles and run them through. We created our own sort of batch processes to, to run all this and then be able to come back to them afterwards and see, you know, like maybe 10% of them, they, did, they just didn't work very well. Um, and then so we would hand do those ones. But then it really did allow us to sort of focus on the art right. And focus on really touching it up and, and doing things that you can't just do as a, you know, as a modder or whatever. How many uh, uh, people from the original games took part in working on the remaster? Oh boy. I, I'll sure I'll get the number wrong, but let's see. Uh, I know Nelson was there. Um, and um, John was there. Uh, there's probably a good half dozen or so like kind of core um, myself included and then uh, we would pull in people like Derek Watts, who I'm sure you know, um, he wasn't working directly on it, but we would we'd pull him in every once in a while. You know, like when we did uh, a lot of the visual improvements to Mass Effect 1, yep. the environment levels, we'd actually play through the levels with Derek 
and then do screenshots and he would pull out like old concepts and things like that from the original Mass Effect and then paint over the screenshots we had of sort of our uprise version of, of the trilogy and say, well, here's where you could improve it. And it still stays on point for, you know, um, the original vision and everything like that. So having people like him involved was great. Parrish, who handled a lot of cinematics back in the day, um, he was uh, working with our teams that, to uh, really improve all of those, uh, especially the pre-rendered cinematics yep. in the game. So, yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a small core group, um, you know, still there. But it was, by and large, uh, people who were new to the franchise. And I'm sure pulled into the Bioware, you know, mystique because of Mass Effect in a large part, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I got to say, like, we, we, we were talking offline before this, right? Before this about how long we spent in, in work from home sort of situation, remote yes. distributed development. So, yep. like, 14 of the 21 months, I think, a long time. Insane. But... Um, you know, one of the things I, I I really believe helped us get through that was the fact that every time we went to you know, work with another partner, whether it was someone at EA or someone external, uh, we would kept bumping into fans. Like they were fans of the franchise. They knew what it was about. And not only were they, of course, excited that we were doing a remaster, being a part of it, they were just, you know, so there was just this instant bond, right? And And an understanding of what we were trying to do where we came from, where we wanted to get to. And, you know, I think without that, it would have made the last, you know, 14 months work from home much more challenging because we don't get to see each other. We don't get to talk. And, yeah. you know, that is, that's a huge part of, of game development. It's just those, you know, how many of those just little, call them water cooler moments or whatever, where you just bump into someone and you start, you know, talking about an idea or a problem and you want to solve it. And, uh, but honestly, I think, you know, the, the Mass Effect bond, if you want to call it that, I think sure. really just helped us all, um, stay focused on, you know, what we had to get done in this time and, and just shortcut it a lot of the, the, probably the challenging conversations. Too. Yeah. You had a roadmap, right. And I think yeah. that's one of the tough things with game development is you, yeah. ha you have your design documents and your, you know, your slices that you can kind of see where this is all going, but there is a lot of fumbling around in the dark yeah. and a lot of happy accidents <laughs> that happened, but you guys had an idea of where you wanted to go Yep. And you could, uh, you know, it wasn't ideal, but you managed to pull it all off. <laughs> yeah. Did you hit yeah. the the milestone scheduling the way that you wanted to along the way? or? Yeah, for the yeah. most part. I mean, I think uh, I mentioned bugs before. There were a lot of bugs, uh, more than we anticipated. So, you know, um, I had to double down on that. And then there was a period in the in the in the development where, um, you know, the game was fully playable. Finally, uh, we weren't just, you know, comparing assets from the original, like this, this model to this model, we were actually playing, got in and played the game. So yeah. at that point we opened it up to, uh, both sort of like a play test for internal at EA, but also just other people that kind of come in. And I think the, the interesting thing we, we found there was that, um, as much improved as everything was that, gap between mass effect one and two was almost more apparent than previously because now that everything was beautiful and kind of upraised it kind of it highlighted maybe some more of the flaws a little bit more plus of course we're a little bit further along and people expect a little bit you know more of a smoother experience yeah so at that point we actually said you know we're going to take a little bit more time and really uplift me one uh further and uh, you know ea was all for it and and so we we took a little bit extra time with it there at the end and i, I think you know when you you see the response to Mass Effect One specifically, and the improvements we made there. That's because we we sort of said no. This this has to go further than than we originally intended. Awesome, Mac. I want to be cognizant of your time. How much oh. can, can, do you, do you have to jump off, or can we talk for another ten minutes or so? Yeah, we got another ten minutes. Are good. Okay, yeah. great. I've got a question from uh, Jake Velasquez, uh, who is saying, "Caden uh, romance for male Shep in ME One and Two, please." <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a tough one because, um, you know, the content that's uh, in there that people are, are referring to, um, it's not complete. And, you know, early on, we said, you know, story, uh, dialogue, choices. Um, that was actually the fourth thing that we actually sort of crossed off our list when we started was, is there anything we don't want to touch? Is there anything that, you know, we should really keep the same? And I think when we looked at sort of the 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 heart and soul of what made the trilogy what it is yep. you talk about my shepherd you talk about you know fans are are very quick to 
to claim their shepherd as their own. And I think what they mean with that is it's everything around the choices they've made about how the shepherd looks, yes. but also the choices that their shepherd made throughout um, with relationships and things like that. And so being that that was sort of what we considered the heart and soul of it, we didn't want to touch it. And it's, it is, um, I, I've, I've struggled for an analogy. Pick up sticks isn't the right one, but like you start pulling on any of the narrative threads, like it's like, you know what, we'll just change this one conversation. The whole thing starts to unravel really fast because there's connections and, and you can imagine with all the choices you have that just yeah. spread out. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, let's just pull on this. Well, no, let's pull on this thread. And we just, you know, maybe it was because of I, as a person who sort of had to manage all of those you know inter interwoven pieces back in the day i was you know uh, hesitant to go in and touch them but uh, ultimately you know early on we said look no story changes no character changes um you know another good example um we talk about is is uh you know it would be really easy to take like for example uh, liara from mass effect 3 right she's yeah. definitely um, a higher fidelity model she looks better you can just copy paste that you know put her in two put her in three put her in one as well but um, as you all know, her arc has her changed, not just her character, but also the way she looks as you mm -hmm. go from game to game. Right. So, yeah, we want her to look higher fidelity in Mass Effect 1, but she should still look like Liara did. She was a little bit more, you know, naive and a little bit more kind of figuring herself out. And her and, and the way she looked, her likeness represented that. Same with Ashley. Obviously, Garrus with his scar and two and stuff like that. So. Um, really trying to make sure that the character's likeness and how they how they were represented in each game and then the stories around that stayed consistent. You know, I think that's just something we, you know, until you either go into full-on remake or into the future of, of Mass Effect, it's just like you just leave those the way they were. Talk to me about the, um, the way you guys can sort of plot the game. Is this something mm -hmm. that, because it takes a long time to, you know, get playable and, and to you know, see how things are going to go back and forth through choices in the game itself, in the in the video game. Is yep. there, a, you know, a whiteboard kind of scenario? Do you tack up bits of script and are there lines going in every direction yeah. <laughs> so that you can kind of visualize where all yeah. of this is going to go? It just, it all sounds and feels impossible to me to, to think about yeah. how you guys conceptualize it and then actually make a game out of that. Yeah. Well, you know, we were talking about before, that's something that we actually even evolved over the course of the three games. So again, a team working together. Yeah. Mass Effect 1, I still remember like some of the, the levels, they were fully built and playable. Uh, I won't call anyone out specifically. And then we kind of went, whoa, whoa, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, I mean, we've spent all this time and energy to get it to a point where you could almost ship it. Yeah. And then we go, oh, this is make sense. We got to redo it, right? We learned from that so that yeah. in, in, in two and three, what we started to do was a bit more, you know, paperwork ahead of time where we would plot out, you know, each mission or level because it was, a, you know, a bunch of levels usually together uh, that we'd string together to tell the story, right? And um, so we would try to in, incorporate some sort of approval process and review process to get feedback before we actually started making it. So that was step one. Um, but for three specifically, like I remember I created a giant um, Visio diagram once we sort of knew what each um, level or mission was going to be of the game. And it was pasted up on a, on a essentially a whiteboard and you could map out the whole game. You could see where things unlock. You could see, oh, I see I, this part of the critical path doesn't open up until you've done these missions or two or three of these missions. So, yeah, we usually have those kind of charts to handle all that. And then, of course, all the plot states we just there's just a giant tool that just stores everything that you could possibly like just thousands of permutations of things and and uh you can use it for reference but a lot of it you do have to keep in your head when, when you're planning and and sorting things out so you went back to unreal for uh working on mass effect one two and three here again yeah. um but the studio shifted to frostbite with yeah. uh, andromeda and with anthem and with dragon age as well it, yeah. Is are we continue? Are you guys going to continue on with Frostbite now that you've had a lot of experience with that? Or are you thinking of back to Unreal? How are you guys feeling right now about all that? Uh, you know, yeah, not really any comment on that right now. But I, I mean, I think yeah, Frostbite is as uh, as a future engine is is. I mean, it's shown what it can do, and it's pretty pretty damn impressive, right? Yeah. So yeah, I'll okay. leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> just curious because you, yeah. you you know you've got a relationship for uh, with Epic and you're you had yeah. to go back and figure stuff out again. So um, just curious. Yeah. Um, t- talk to me about the hardest element of mm. uh, doing this remaster. What was the thing that uh, um, just became excruciating for you guys, but obviously you solved it. I think it kind of goes back to that decision-making process as a developer, you know, like the hardest thing for me. And honestly, until this came out, I hadn't gone back to play any of these games Mm. because all I see is the bugs, right? Right. All I see are the issues, the things that we didn't get done. And so obviously as a, as a developer, you want to go in and fix, improve. And so it's about, it's about striking that balance of knowing when you've done enough and when you're going too far, especially with something that is so beloved because we're you know the the phrase i would use a lot is we're not just remastering you know three games we're re- remastering people's memories of those three games right 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 and um, it's like going back to the star wars original trilogy and adding yeah. some video game looking cg yeah <laughs> yes. yes no exactly and i don't right. mean to insult anybody but uh, yeah. we all exactly. know what i'm talking about yeah, yeah. and yeah. and so it's um you know we had a great relationship with our community going into this and we used a lot of that to sort of, you know, gut check a lot of the things that we we're doing. Although ultimately the decision still rests with you and you've got to, you've got to make the calls at the end of the day about where you're going to prove it. You know, like the environment stuff in, in Mass Effect 1 is a great example. Like we took every sort of, I would say precaution and, and care to make sure that we were staying true to the original. And yet you'll still people hear people say, it's like, oh, but I like Vermeer when it was dark. And it's like, yeah, but it was dark because we just didn't light it very well. I mean, it's, it's a bright sunny beach area. There's no overhead canopy. It should be bright or at least brighter. And there should be fog because you know, it's super humid and everything like that. It just feels more right, but that doesn't matter. That's not how they remember it. And, and they preferred it when it was kind of a little bit darker and you couldn't quite see it things. And, you know, for, for us as developers, and that's what I'm talking about for us as developers, we just look at it and go, that's wrong. Right. But there's a difference between, you know, objectively saying it's right or wrong. And then the very subjective sort of view that people took away from it and, and their experience from it. And, you, and striking that balance is easily the hardest thing that we had to do. Cause it was, that's not a make some decisions day one. And then it's solved. That's a, you're going to get confronted with that question on some level every day, probably. Yeah. Did you guys have to re-record anything? Did you have to get anybody back in the booth to re-record stuff or get Jack yeah. to make more music or anything or <laughs> no um we didn't do anything of that again that was part of the you know don't change any of the characters and don't 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 do that um the one thing though that is cool is that um there was a DLC that I had started to write for Mass Effect 1 that got cut and somehow it was all about AI on Mars mm-hmm. we got, we got there eventually but um um somehow uh, we had gotten um music for it um done and sam had done that i mean sam hulick had done the music for it and i was just kind of trolling through the old files looking at stuff i was like what is this ai music file what is this and i listened to it it's like started asking people did this ever get out did we ever use this and so uh we did uh, go back to sam he, he sort of remixed it for us and that's what we used for the launcher so it was nice that we were able to kind of you know that's use great. a piece of a bit of the history and, and and bring that forward and use it so yeah yeah let, the music I find is as much of a character in this franchise mm. as anything else. Yeah. Um, did you guys do anything with the audio? Did you, did you, I know that there's like this visual gloss over everything and the up and everything. Did yep. you tune everything for modern systems as well? Audio wise? Yeah, they, uh, they did. Um, some of the sample rates are a little bit better. So you're just getting higher fidelity sounds, which is great. Like we compressed up pretty. Yeah tightly back in the day just to fit on a disc right sure, so we were sure. able to loosen some of that so um they also did some remixing on cinematics throughout the the trilogy which i think is great um and then mass Effect one also benefited from just you know injecting some not really new sounds but bringing some sounds from two to one so some of the weapon sounds are slightly improved yep. the mako got an uplift on on its audio just again so it feels a little bit more modern uh one had that feeling of being uh, fairly sparse uh, visually in, yes. in the audio yep. soundscape as well right um and so just finding a few ways to sort of fill things in when we did the uh, environment pass for example like we added fires or things like that to level so then audio would come in and support that as well so mm. just to sort of flesh that out a bit yeah how, how important do you think it is for you and for your colleagues to 
you know, have done this work mm-hmm. and replayed the, the, you know, the the launch of these games as you are kind of repositioning yourselves now to go forward with Mass Effect? How much did this, you know, influence yeah. where you're going to go? I, I, I would like to think that it'll have a really big influence because, like I said, like there's people like me who really struggle to go back and play them. So it's been great to revisit where we came from. Like, um, I joke about all the bugs that I find when I go in there, but there were just as many moments where we were playing through and I was like, I can't believe we pulled this off. Like yeah. when you're, when you're on that last mission on ME one, you know, you're outside of the Citadel, the exterior, uh, there's a giant reaper in the background moving around. You've got people who, uh, physicsing and floating away in space and all the crazy stuff going on. I was like, I forgot we had done all this. Like, that's incredible what we actually achieved in that, first game in in whatever manner we did it and so it is inspiring to go back and look at that and then i think um it's a nice touch point for everyone who worked on it plus you know i think um everyone like i mentioned a lot of people who worked on it hadn't worked on the original so this was kind of their 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 opportunity to kind of come into the franchise and really sort of experience some of that you know some of that magic that really brought it all together and um, I'll, I'll be honest, it's been infectious, like re- regardless of whether they're, you know, internal Bioware people or, or partners we've worked with, that love of the franchise has has been, you know, one of the things that's honestly carried certainly me through, you know, the pandemic and this time, you know, just, you know, yeah. being able to have that common sort of thing to talk about and share and it's been great. And, and I imagine the response from fans and, you know, watching people's playthroughs and all that stuff, it, it must... Yeah. It'd be so gratifying and so mind blowing too, right? Yeah, for sure. And it's exciting to see that you know, the you know, the, there'll be all these uh, Twitch streams now about um, you know, this is my first time playing it, right? And uh, I haven't I haven't worked up the nerve yet to watch any of them, um, but uh, I do know that they're out there, and I, I plan to start seeing some because I am curious just to see what people take away from it. You know, whatever fourteen years on, right? And yeah. and um, I think there'll be a lot of great lessons learned there. But it'll also be interesting just to see. The reception, you know, with new players and yeah. How, how did uh, Mass Effect get started at Bioware? Was it a, you know, a, <laughs> like a three person idea? Like, yeah, because these things always come from like, it's like the Big Bang, right? It starts yep. with with uh, some concept and then it just keeps exploding from there. So how did Mass Effect start? It's funny, uh, again, uh, just recently talking to Greg Zeschuk about that, you know, uh, and he was like, yeah, it was basically him, Ray and Casey at uh, a Greek restaurant here in, in Edmonton, <laughs> Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Amazing. You know, one of those sort of like, we want to make a space opera. Let's do it. And, you know, That's of course, KOTOR had come out and lessons are there. But I, I think, you know, wanting to also uh, work on their own title and and create their own sort of world from that. and. Yeah. That's really where that was the 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 impetus and sort of that uh, you know inciting moment I think and then from there yeah I think everyone was on board for it and just yeah and, and you know this is the sign of an incredible franchise right like not only do does each person involved in each aspect of the game kind of assume some ownership of the the totality of what you guys are crafting but yep. you also I think connect daily with the players all over the world who also have assumed ownership on this, just like Star totally. Wars and and yeah. Star Trek. I mean that that speaks to the the fidelity of this this beautiful work that you guys have built for us, man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you know, I people often ask me, it's like, what do you think of all the fan theories, indoctrination theory? And I'm like, I love it. I mean, if we do our jobs right that means we've created a world that pe- that those can exist right yeah. that people can come up with their own ideas and tell their own stories um and so a they're interested in enough that they do it they love it enough that they do it and the space is there for them to to come up with that I, that's just i love it that's that's it's awesome great. well casey ray and greg are no longer at bioware that's right have you heard from all of them about the the remaster have they all yeah. checked it out yeah yeah, yeah. Well, uh, have I heard from all two of the three? I won't, won't name drop, but yeah, yeah, two of the three so far. Yeah, that's that's wicked. Uh, and you're the 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 project director on this. Are you yep. supervising Mass Effect now? Are you kind of in charge of Mass Effect at Bioware in total? Not really. No, no. no? I think um, 
I've definitely been involved in any and all things Mass Effect uh, up until now. It's been 17 years of Mass Effect in my life. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of Mass Effect. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's the beauty of, of Bioware is that, you know, we can have uh, all these different teams and groups of people. And, and it's kind of like I said, it's in our DNA. So very yeah. cool. Well, we know we've got um, more Mass Effect coming. We don't know anything about it yet. You guys have been very good at keeping that a, a mystery. <laughs> Uh, but the whole time I'm playing this game, I'm thinking to myself, why is there no movie? Why is there no animated show? You know, where is yep. the extension? Like, it feels like an extended universe, but yep. you pivot and it's it's not on Netflix. It's not on, you know, Disney Plus. Or, is is that percolating again? Is that sort of ramping up that sort of transmedia yeah. opportunity? I, yeah, I won't speak to anything specific, but those opportunities have always kind of existed. Certainly from our point of view, like we like you, we believe that, you know, it, it could transcend media. I think that's, you know, when you actually go back to the original vision, there was that concept of this should be able to transcend, you know, sure. any media. Um, yep. That's why we pushed into books and comics and we did try to do things with the movie for a while and that didn't work out, but um, you know, I just, you know, keep watching, you know, keep playing first. Yes. Right. Keep playing. Get, get reacquainted then, yeah. or get acquainted. I get acquainted, yeah. Yeah, and then we see where this goes. I got a, uh, right. a super chat from uh, Matthew uh, Nugent Marcou. He says, uh, Mr. Walters, did you patch ME2 to allow unlocking Legion earlier to access all existing dialogue with other characters? I know he was locked due to Xbox 360 disk swap limitations. That is a very specific question. That's a question. very specific que question. Um, yeah, there was that, but it was also, you know, we didn't change the order with which you could unlock any of the characters, I don't think. Uh, I know what they're talking about, which is just kind of like you get, as soon as you get um, Legion, of course, you trigger uh, certain events in the game. I won't give too much away, which then kind of puts you on a timer. Of course, you can have some of those moments, but it, at, at a cost. <laughs> but um no, we didn't change any of that because again, that that falls into that that vein of um, regardless of why we made the choice in the decision, or, or sorry, in the first place, um, it would be it we just have to move too many things around and it's Jenga, yeah, man. Support it. It's oh, Jenga. Yeah, right. It's, you take out the yeah, wrong block, you're screwed. It's Jenga with razor blades. Yeah, <laughs> oh, brutal. <laughs> uh, um, I'm going to leave you with one last question here, and uh, I, and it's a tough one. It's a simple mm. one, but it's a tough one. What's your favorite part of what you guys have achieved with uh, the Legendary Edition? Um, honestly, it's the, I think it's the same probably as it is whenever, you know, we finish one of these games is it's the fan reaction so far. And I don't just mean to the game being out. Um, uh, you know, we did a fan tribute trailer. Um, we also worked with like a community council throughout this process. And so we were actually able to include them, you know, as we were going and and showing them assets and just their reaction it's it, it just reminds me of when i you know you back in the day when we could do this when you go to a con yeah and you get to actually interact with the fans and they're just they're just so enthusiastic and yeah. genuine about their love of it and and it's interesting because they they all love it for a different reason right so they've all got their own personal story about it and it's just great hearing all of that again and seeing it all again. And I'm glad that, you know, the fans are receiving it the way we hope they would. Um, you know, we put a lot of love and a lot of passion into obviously the original, but also in remastering it. So yeah. seeing the response has been great, honestly. Well, Mac, uh, first of all, thank you for the games. They're fantastic to revisit again, and they are a definite bright spot still in this year, you know, where we're consumed by a lot of negativity. It is amazing to go and explore your universe. But thank you very much, sir, for uh, taking some time. I know you're very busy still with, you know, yeah. getting this game out there. Yeah. I appreciate you very much being here in the basement with me. And thank you to everybody that tuned in. Um, and thank you for your questions. And we will see you very soon. Until then, play forever.